Hello, my name is Jaru. Today I'm talking about Deltarune. There will be major spoilers for both Deltarune and Undertale, so please play them both before watching this. Before I get to the main script for this video, I just want to shout out some awesome folks who made fan art of some of my videos. This person made a picture of Chris flailing around Asriel's body, which is hilarious. But what I'm really excited for is this. Look at this. This beautiful person made sprites of Oberon Smog. <laughs> it's amazing. God bless you. Go follow them on Twitter and Reddit and tell them how awesome they are. You are a god among men. Holy cow. <laughs> It's so freaking cool. Oh, uh, That's all the art I've seen, but please let me know if any of you out there make fan art of my theories. I'd love to show it off and thank you in my videos. Now, back to the script. This video is the sixth in a series, so I highly recommend you check out my previous videos in order to get some important context. Today's video will consist of me discussing one of the most interesting mysteries in Deltarune, the Shadow Crystals. These mystical pieces of glass wield strange supernatural powers, are seemingly tied to some of the most mysterious characters in the franchise, and they could very well be the key to uncovering the deeper mysteries of Deltarune. First, I will go over all the information we currently have regarding the Shadow Crystals, then I'll discuss all the possibilities regarding what they are and what exactly they do, and lastly, I'll end this video by giving my own theory regarding what these crystals are, what they mean for the story thus far, and how important they will be for the story going forward. I'd love to say that my theory on the Shadow Crystals is completely unique and nobody has ever thought of it before, but unfortunately, the basic premise of my theory has definitely been brought up in the Deltarune community. That said, while having an unoriginal premise, my theory still has plenty of unique elements that make it interesting, and it will still have that classic Jaru insanity that you guys love. I guarantee I'll surprise you at least once before this video is over. With all that out of the way, let's discuss the Shadow Crystals. The first time the Shadow Crystals are brought up is in Chapter 1, after defeating Jevil. Upon looking in your inventory, the item is described as a sharp shadow moves like water in your hand. You have collected one. Using the item while in the card kingdom causes it to say you held the crystal up to your eye. For some strange reason, for just a brief moment, you thought you saw toys strewn on the floor, but it must have just been your imagination. This seems to be a reference to the unused classroom that was transformed into the Card Kingdom, as that is a room with toys strewn on the floor. Technically, Toriel's classroom also has toys strewn on the floor, so it's possible it's referring to that, but it's probably talking about the unused classroom. Upon entering the Light World, the Shadow Crystal becomes glass. If you read the info on the glass, it says, There is a small shard of something in your pocket. It feels like glass, but... The way this description trails off suggests that there's something unusual about this item that makes it more than just a shard of glass. This is further demonstrated when you use the glass, as it says, you looked through the glass. For some strange reason, for just a brief moment, you thought you saw through your hand. If you tried to discard the glass, it says, you didn't quite understand why, but the thought of discarding it felt very wrong. 
Notably, if you try to use glass twice in a row, it just says that nothing happened. It also says that nothing happened if you try to use the Shadow Crystal while inside the castle town, if you haven't gone to the cyber world yet, or if you're playing on the latest patch. It's a little bit confusing, but basically the castle town has no unique vision in the Shadow Crystal at this point in time. Speaking of which, the next time the Shadow Crystals come up is in Chapter 2, when talking to Sham. Prior to Patch 1.07, you actually wouldn't receive a Shadow Crystal from Jevil, and talking to Sham in Chapter 2 would be your first introduction to the item. If you've defeated Jevil on this save file, Sham says, Oh? What's that? It seems like he gave something to you. That's right. You must not have noticed it. That crystal. It's nearly invisible, but you've been holding it this whole time. Here, I'll take it off your hands and appraise it. Incredible. To think he had a shadow crystal. Shadow crystals, so called because you can only see their shadow. Call it a premonition, but I get the feeling you may find more of these, if you continue to defeat strong adversaries like him, that is. If you can gather more Shadow Crystals, bring them here. I'm sure I can stitch together something incredible for you." This is very interesting dialogue for a variety of reasons. For one, it gives you this description of the crystal that defines it as being invisible and yet still casting a shadow. That is fascinating, because that's not how glass is supposed to work. Normally, a shadow is cast when an object blocks a stream of light. However, glass is translucent, and thus the light passes right through, and no shadow is created. If the glass was imperfect or cloudy in some way, then it would be possible for it to cast a faint shadow. But the more translucent the glass, the less of a shadow it should cast. As such, since the shadow crystal is invisible, all of the light should be able to pass right through, and thus it shouldn't cast any shadow. And yet it does. This gets even more puzzling when you combine this with the description of the shadow as dancing like water in your hand. It is possible to get a shadow that behaves like this if you were shining light through some sort of liquid, like if you shined a flashlight through a glass of water. However, once again, if the crystal is invisible, then it shouldn't be casting any shadow, liquid or otherwise. So how can this be possible? Well, there's only one logical explanation. In order for the human eye to perceive an object, light has to reflect off of that object. If an object is invisible, that means no light is reflecting off of it for our eyes to perceive. Similarly, in order for a shadow to be cast, that object has to be blocking that light in some way. As such, in order for an object to be invisible and cast a shadow, that requires the light to be completely absorbed by the object. It cannot reflect any of the light, because if it reflects the light, then it would allow us to see it. At the same time, since the object is absorbing the light that hits it, that light is unable to continue on its normal trajectory, and thus a shadow is cast. So, assuming this isn't just some magical nonsense that ignores all logic, the evidence seems to imply that the Shadow Crystal is absorbing the light that strikes it. However, there's an issue with this explanation. If an object absorbed all the light that hit it, it would not be translucent like glass. It would be pitch black. If the Shadow Crystal was simply a black hole that absorbed light, you wouldn't be able to see through it. It would just be a black, crystal-shaped object sitting in the palm of your hand. If you are able to see through a piece of glass and see what's on the other side, then that means the light is passing through to the other side. Otherwise, the object wouldn't be translucent. 
So, what we have are three characteristics that seem to contradict each other. One, the crystal cannot be seen, and thus light cannot be reflecting off of it. Two, the crystal casts a shadow, and thus the natural light must be getting blocked by the crystal. Three, the crystal is translucent, which means the light must be passing through the crystal. All three of these characteristics cannot be true at the same time. If one and two are true, then the crystal would be pitch black instead of translucent. If one and three were true, then it wouldn't cast a shadow. And of course, two and three can't be true at the same time in any circumstance, as casting a shadow and being translucent are opposite concepts. So, what is the solution? Well, if all three of these can't be true at the same time, then that means one of them simply is not true. One of these characteristics doesn't actually exist, and we are simply misunderstanding something about the crystal. Thankfully, we know exactly which of these characteristics isn't true. Naturally, it's number three. The crystal is not translucent, and we know this because of what happens when Chris actually tries to look through said crystal. Whenever they try it, they end up seeing something that shouldn't be there. In the Card Kingdom, they see toys strewn on the floor. In the Cyber World, they see the computer lab. In the Light World, they see through their own hand. And if you have Susie with you, you see her glaring coldly at Chris, when in reality, she was happily smiling at Chris. If this crystal was truly translucent, then it would show you what's on the other side of the glass and nothing more. The fact that it's showing Chris completely different imagery than what is actually there means that Chris is not seeing through the crystal. It is instead constantly projecting imagery that looks very similar to its surroundings, which gives the illusion of it being translucent. The crystal is sorta acting like an iPhone while in camera mode. While in camera mode, your phone shows you an image of what's on the other side of the phone. This isn't your phone being translucent, this is just your phone using technology to project an image of what's on the other side. It's an illusion of translucency, but it isn't actually translucent. The same is true of the shadow crystal. To be clear, this isn't some grand or crazy theory on my part. This is just the only logical explanation. Obviously, we're dealing with a world of magic and reality warping, so it's entirely possible that this crystal doesn't abide by logic or physics, and it just does what it does because the plot demands it. However, if logic applies to this crystal, then the most logical interpretation is that the first two characteristics are true. The crystal absorbs light and thus prevents you from seeing it while also casting a shadow. However, it is not translucent. Instead, the crystal constantly projects an image of its surroundings, and this creates the illusion of it being translucent while also being the source of the strange visions. Of course, these are just the physical characteristics of the crystal. Even if this logic explains what the crystal is doing, it doesn't explain how or why. When it comes to the question of how it's projecting these images and visions, I can see three possible explanations. Sci-fi technology, magic, or reality warping. Here's how these explanations work, starting with sci-fi technology. The idea of creating technology that renders you invisible is a fairly common trope, with the specific idea of an invisibility suit being especially popular. Fictional characters like the Predator and Solid Snake use this technology, but more importantly, people in real life have made rough attempts at creating this sort of tech. 
The idea behind this tech is that you cover the suit in cameras and electronic screens, and the cameras record your surroundings before projecting those surroundings onto the screens that cover your body. This creates the illusion of invisibility. Maybe the Shadow Crystals employ similar technology to achieve their own invisibility. Alternatively, the crystals could be magic in some way. Maybe they act as a sort of crystal ball that shows you visions of some sort. And lastly, it could be that this object isn't technology or magical and is instead some sort of glitch in reality. Like, maybe this is some sort of strange material that warps time and space in order to show you alternate versions of its surroundings. Now, that's interesting and all, but which of these explanations is the truth? Well, that's the tricky thing. In most other settings, you could probably dismiss one or two of these as not making sense for that world. But in Undertale, and by extension Deltarune, we saw examples of all three of these phenomena at different points. So the question isn't whether these options are possible in the Deltarune setting. We know that they are. The question is, which of these phenomena are the Shadow Crystals most tied to? But in order to understand that, we have to understand what exactly the Shadow Crystals are showing us. If we can figure out what the nature of these visions are, that could be a vital clue in figuring out what the crystals are, and why they work the way that they do. So, let's look at these visions in a little more detail. In total, we have five different visions. It showed the toys strewn on the floor in the Card Kingdom. It showed the computer lab in the Cyber World. It showed nothing in the Castle Town. It let Chris see straight through their hand when Chris was alone. And it showed Susie glaring at Chris coldly when they were together. So, here's the question of the hour. What are these visions? There are a lot of possible answers to this question, but don't worry, we'll be covering all of them. I asked the community what their best guesses were regarding the nature of these visions, and after reading all your feedback, I condensed your answers down into a list of theories. Here is every single possible explanation for the Shadow Crystals that I have seen in the community. The crystals show truth. The crystals show lies. The crystals show the opposite of whatever you're looking at. The crystals show whichever world you're not currently in. The crystals show the public's perspective. The crystals show Chris's perspective. The crystals show the player's perspective. The crystals are being controlled by a third party. The crystals show the past. The crystals show the future. The crystals show alternate timelines. The crystals show a world where Chris doesn't exist. The crystals show a world where darkness doesn't exist. The crystals see through darkness. The crystals see through illusions. The crystals show the goner world. The crystals show a world where the player doesn't exist. The crystals show a higher level of reality. The crystals show nothing and it's all in Chris's head. The crystals show that your choices don't matter. The crystals show what you fear. The crystals show your memories. The crystals show dreams. The crystals show broken dreams. The crystals show camera angles. The crystals show what would happen on the weird route. The crystals show whatever is most likely to drive you insane. The crystals show the core of things. The crystals show the Undertale timeline, and the crystals show good things in the Dark World and bad things in the Light World. That's 30 possible explanations, which is obviously a lot to analyze. But since I already made a three hour video analyzing night candidates, I think I can handle this analysis as well. That said, I think we need to have some sort of standards that an explanation needs to meet in order to be considered a likely option. 
Namely, I think there are a few questions that need to be answered. For one, a detail I have yet to mention about the Shadow Crystals is that if you fail to collect Spamton's Crystal and talk to Sham, they say that defeating someone who holds a Shadow Crystal is no small feat. This suggests that the Shadow Crystals provide some sort of meaningful advantage when it comes to combat or conflict in general. The crystals give no apparent combat benefit to Chris, Susie, or Ralse, which implies that whatever advantage shadow crystals provide is tied to the visions that they give you. So that's the first requirement that these explanations need to meet in order to seem viable. They need to provide an explanation of how the shadow crystals could make you more capable as a combatant. The second requirement is that the explanation needs to explain these visions in a way that makes sense and is consistent across all the visions. If an explanation only makes sense for a few of the visions, that's not good enough. These are the requirements that matter the most, although there is one additional requirement that I'd like to discuss. Namely, it's possible that the visions provided by these crystals are responsible for driving Jevil and Spamton insane. So if an explanation can address how these visions drove them mad, then that would contribute to the likelihood of the explanation being true. That said, since we don't know for certain that the crystals are responsible for driving those two insane, I won't consider this requirement to be absolutely necessary. Although, if a theory does address their insanity, that will certainly boost its chances of being correct. I will now go through all 30 of these theories, explain how they work, what evidence supports them, and some potential shortcomings with these interpretations. By the end of this, I should have trimmed this list down enough to give us a better idea of what explanations make the most sense. First off is the crystals show truth which holds the idea that the shadow crystals show you the truth about whatever it is you're currently looking at. The main evidence for this theory is the Card Kingdom and Cyberworld visions showing the unused classroom and the computer lab, respectively. These are the true forms of these dark worlds, so that evidence makes sense. Why the crystal doesn't show the supply closet when used in the castle town is a little unclear, but I guess you could argue that the supply closet was too dark to see anything. Or maybe the Grand Fountain prevents you from using the Shadow Crystal while in its vicinity. It's a hole in this theory, admittedly, but the lack of a castle town vision is a hole in most of these theories, so I won't be too harsh. That said, where truth theory becomes a little... oh, what's a good word for it? Uh, I just can't think of it right now. It means... suspect or unreliable? It starts with a D. Hmm. Can't think of it. Oh well. Where truth theory becomes a little questionable is when it comes to the light world visions. Seeing through Chris's hand could be revealing some profound truth about the nature of Chris or about the nature of the entity that is controlling Chris. Maybe seeing through their hand is showing that Chris isn't a real person and that they are simply a hollow puppet to be controlled by the player. Or maybe it's showing that the player isn't a real part of this world and that's why we can't see ourselves. It's honestly a bit of a stretch, but you could still spin something with this vision. However, where this option feels especially questionable is with the Susie vision. If the Shadow Crystals showed the truth, then that would imply that the truth is that Susie secretly hates Chris, which seems extremely unlikely. Even if you argue that this is revealing the truth that Susie hates the person controlling Chris, that doesn't make sense in this context, as Susie has no idea that Chris is being possessed at this time. Furthermore, it's unclear how seeing the truth would make you a more effective combatant. 
Like, sure, I could see some uses depending on what kind of truths it revealed, but based off this Susie vision, I have my doubts that these truths would help you fight any better. Like, how would seeing Susie glaring at me make fighting her any easier? That said, it is highly probable that Jevil and Spamton were driven mad due to discovering some horrible secret. So having a crystal that literally reveals the truth could certainly work as an explanation for their madness. So even with its flaws, truth theory definitely explains some of this evidence quite well. Overall, true theory has some shortcomings, but it makes enough sense that I think it's a viable option. So I'll keep it on the list. Next is The Crystals Show Lies. This is the opposite of the last theory, and thus the main evidence is primarily supplied by the Light World visions. Namely, Susie was clearly not glaring at Chris coldly, so that could be a lie. And Chris was clearly there holding the crystal, so the crystal making it look like Chris's hand wasn't even there could also be interpreted as a lie. When it comes to the Dark World visions, the idea is that the crystal is showing a lie by showing you the Light World when you're actually in the Dark World. Honestly, that's a bit of a contrived explanation for these particular visions, but it's not completely impossible. However, where this option totally falls apart is when it comes to increasing your combat effectiveness. Say what you will about the truth theory, at least seeing the truth about someone could theoretically give you the edge in a fight. But seeing lies about somebody? How on earth could that make it any easier to fight them? That makes no sense. Furthermore, how would a crystal that only shows lies drive Jevil and Spamton insane? If these crystals showed some insane nonsense that was clearly untrue, wouldn't Jevil and Spampton dismiss these visions as false? Why would they let these visions drive them mad when they're clearly not real? That doesn't make sense either. As such, unlike truth theory, I think lies theory has too many problems to be viable. So I will go ahead and scratch that one off the list. Next is the crystals show the opposite of whatever you're looking at. The idea with this one is primarily supported by the Susie vision, as it shows her coldly glaring when in reality she's smiling happily. It then shows Chris's hand not being there, which is the opposite of it being there, much like how it doesn't show anything for the castle town, despite the castle town clearly existing. Furthermore, in the Dark World, it shows the Light World version of those worlds, which is the opposite of where Chris actually was at the time. That said, while technically explaining the visions, this theory is a bit dubious due to it showing such drastically different visions. Why show the opposite of smiling for Susie, the opposite of existing for Chris and the Castletown, and the opposite of the Dark World for the other two visions? That's pretty random opposites to latch onto. But more importantly, it provides zero combat benefit. Seeing the opposite of what your opponent truly is seems pretty worthless, especially if the crystal just shows that person as not existing like it did with Chris. It also doesn't make sense for this being the cause of Jevil and Spampton's insanity. As such, while superficially supported by the evidence, opposite theory only really makes sense if you squint at it, and its lack of combat usefulness and madness-inducing qualities encourages me to scratch this one off the list as well. Next is the crystal show whichever world you're not currently in. This theory is most strongly supported by the Cyber World and Card Kingdom, as those show the Light World while you're in the Dark World. However, if that were the case, why does it not show anything for the Castle Town? Even if you just said you saw a dark room, that would be something, but the text acts like it just doesn't work. Furthermore, it really doesn't make sense for the Light World visions. 
Chris, seeing through their hand, seems to make sense at first glance, as they clearly don't exist in the Dark World at the time of this vision, but why would it just let Chris see through their hand? This implies the crystal is showing the same environment that Chris is currently surrounded by in the light world. If it said that you saw darkness or nothing, that would be one thing. But if it specifically let Chris see through their hand to the world around them, then that implies that it's not showing any sort of dark world. This theory makes even less sense with Susie, as she's not currently in the Dark World either, and yet it still shows her standing there. This difference between how it handles Chris and how it handles Susie seems to directly contradict the idea of it showing whatever world you're not currently in, as the outcome should be consistent between the two of them. And then there's the matter of combat effectiveness. Randomly being able to see into the light world doesn't seem particularly useful in a fight. It would be like saying, don't mess with me, I know what's going on in France at any given moment. It's like, cool, but I'm still going to punch you. <laughs> you could argue that seeing into the light world is responsible for driving Jevil and Spamton mad, but I don't think that explanation alone really cuts it. The existence of the light world is not a secret. Jevil and Spamton knew the light world existed long before they found these crystals. All Darkners know about and understand the nature of Lightners. As such, in order to drive them insane, the crystals wouldn't just need to show them the light world, it would need to show them something horrible in the light world, like Gaster or the Knight or something like that. Just allowing them to see that the light world exists isn't enough. As such, due to the light world visions not making sense and the lack of combat usefulness, I'm going to go ahead and remove other world theory from the list. Next up is the crystals show the public's perspective. This idea holds that the crystals show what the general light world population thinks about whatever object or person you're looking at. The dark worlds look like the unused classroom and the computer lab because most people don't know that the dark world versions of those places exist, so it just shows their light world counterparts instead. Susie looks like she's glaring angrily because most people know her as an angry troublemaker. And Chris can see through their hand because society at large just doesn't care about them. Nobody has much of an opinion about Chris, so the crystal sees right through them. And the Castletown vision doesn't work at all because not only does nobody know about the Dark World version, but also because most people have no knowledge or interest in the school supply closet. So much like Chris, it just shows nothing. Now, that's a fine enough explanation at first glance, as you can easily spin the evidence to fit this narrative the way I did. However, almost all of these examples become dubious the more you look into them. Sure, not many people care about the supply closet, but not many people care about the unused classroom or computer lab either, so why do they get visions when the Castletown doesn't? Also, while the Susie vision mostly lines up, saying Chris isn't cared about by the town seems objectively incorrect. Almost every single person in town knows Chris by name, is kind to them, and seems to care about them at least a little bit. The Diner Lady, Father Alvin, Asgore, Toriel, Alphys, Noel, and Rudy are just a few of the characters to show interest and care for Chris as a person. Even if people only cared about Chris due to them being Asriel's sibling, that's still something. So I can't imagine that the crystal would just show nothing for Chris. That just doesn't add up. Furthermore, this option utterly falls apart when it comes to combat effectiveness. It provides zero conceivable benefit, as knowing what society thinks about someone is a far cry from actually knowing something that can help you fight that person, especially if society knows nothing or knows very little about that person. 
It also doesn't really make sense when it comes to explaining Jevil and Spamton's madness. Why would seeing how Lightners view things drive Spamton and Jevil crazy? Darkners understand their purpose is to act as tools and toys to entertain the Lightners, and most of them are fine with that. Even characters like King aren't angry that the Lightners treated the Darkners as toys for their amusement, he's just mad that they stopped using the Darkners altogether. So if the King had no issue with the status quo, why would Spamton and Jevil? And why would they have so much issue with this that it drives them insane? These questions have no clear answer. As such, while public perception theory is a creative interpretation that is somewhat reasonable, the inconsistency in terms of characterizing Chris and the citizens of the hometown, combined with the lack of combat effectiveness or madness-inducing properties, incline me to scratch this option from the list. Next up is The Crystals Show Chris's Perspective. This option holds that the crystals are showing what Chris thinks about whatever you look at through the crystals. In The Dark World, it shows that Chris can only imagine these dark worlds as being their light world equivalent. Maybe Chris just can't get invested in the dark world because they know what they really are. And maybe since Chris has no confirmed experience with the supply closet, the crystal just doesn't work in the castle town. And since Chris may have depression or self-esteem issues, they just see right through their own hand, as they maybe see themselves as being worthless. Or alternatively, maybe this is a commentary on Chris being possessed. Chris can't see their body as being real or being their actual body due to it being controlled by the player. So the crystal doesn't show their body at all. It's a little bit of a stretch, but it's not inconceivable. However, what definitely doesn't make sense and actually seems to contradict this theory entirely is the Susie vision. This vision would imply that Chris views Susie as being this angry and cold person who secretly hates them. That really doesn't make sense, as Chris clearly cares a great deal about Susie, as shown by Chris being healed the most by Susie T. You could argue the crystal is just showing what Chris fears about Susie, but that's an entirely separate theory. This theory is that the crystal show what you think about that particular topic, and it doesn't seem in character for Chris to see Susie in such a negative light. Furthermore, this theory gets extremely dubious when it comes to the usefulness in combat. How could seeing what you already think about a person help you fight them? Why would that provide any benefit? That doesn't make sense. Also, how would seeing your own thoughts drive you insane? If we assume the crystal is showing whatever the current wielder of the crystal thinks about whatever they're currently looking at, then why would Jevil or Spampton seeing their own thoughts drive them insane? Alternatively, if we assume the Shadow Crystals exclusively show visions of what Chris specifically thinks about certain topics, then how would that drive Jevil and Spampton insane? Why would seeing how Chris feels about toys and playing cards and classrooms be responsible for making Jevil lose his mind? And if it exclusively shows how Chris views the world, then how would that help anyone in a fight? It would also raise the huge question as to why these crystals are showing how Chris in particular feels about the world. It would make far more sense and require far less convoluted explanations for the crystals to just show what the current wielder thinks about the world. Although, as we already discussed, that version of this theory doesn't make a ton of sense either. As such, while Chris perspective theory has a few decent pieces of evidence, the mischaracterization of Chris and Susie, the lack of combat usefulness, and the lack of means for driving Jevil and Spampton insane pushes me to scratch this theory off the list. Next up is The Crystals Show The Player's Perspective. 
This is very similar to the last theory, but it gains an extra level of meta due to it being the player instead of Chris. However, what it gains in meta, it loses in common sense. The player has never seen what the computer lab or unused classroom looked like prior to sealing the fountains, and we get these visions before sealing the cyber world and card kingdom. As such, it makes no sense for the player to view these dark worlds as just being mundane classrooms and computer labs. Similarly, why would the player view Susie as angry and cold by the end of chapter 2? By that time, Susie has undergone substantial character development and has saved Chris's life on two separate occasions, so the idea of the player viewing Susie in a negative light still doesn't really add up. Pretty much the only vision that makes even a little bit of sense is the one where Chris's hand is invisible. If we, as the player, view Chris as nothing more than the puppet that we use to interact with the world of Deltarune, then it could make a little bit of sense for Chris to be invisible to us. But that doesn't make up for the other visions making so little sense, nor does it explain why the player has no vision when in the castle town. The saving grace of this theory comes from the combat effectiveness and madness-inducing properties. If the Shadow Crystal granted you the perspective of the player, then that would give any character in Deltarune a substantial combat advantage, as having that greater understanding of this video game world would definitely make winning battles easier. Furthermore, Jevil and Spamton realizing their world is a video game would definitely be a legitimate reason for them to be driven insane. However, while these meta layers to this theory make sense, they don't explain the visions very well at all, and more importantly, this theory relies on these shadow crystals making broad assumptions about how the player feels about these characters, which doesn't really seem in line with Toby Fox's writing style. If the Shadow Crystals showed the player's perspective, I would expect this perspective to be one that is accurate to all players, and not all players are going to view Susie in a negative light or view Chris as a mere puppet. As such, given this theory fails to explain the visions in a believable manner, I'm going to be knocking player perspective theory off the list. Next up is the crystals are being controlled by a third party. This idea holds that the visions given by the crystals are not random. They are being specifically sent to Chris by some unknown person. This unknown person would likely be Gaster, given that he seems to be tied to these crystals, but it could also be some other unknown character. Whatever the case, this option combines ambiguity with versatility to make it simultaneously one of the most logical options and one of the least compelling. If Gaster is sending these visions to Chris through the crystals, then he would be capable of showing whatever visions suit his mysterious plan. And since we have no way of knowing what Gaster's plans are, that means we have no way of knowing if this theory actually works in the context of Gaster's character. Maybe he's controlling these visions, maybe he isn't, but if he is controlling them, then that makes this a perfectly suitable option for all of the evidence. He could send Chris these Dark World visions because he wants to lure Chris into sealing the fountains. He could send Chris no vision for the castle town because that would reveal something that he wants to keep secret. He could show Jevil and Spamton whatever visions would be necessary for driving them insane. And since Gaster is clearly a powerful and influential character, it makes sense that he would be able to make you more effective in combat. As such, while extremely vague in terms of the specific details, the idea of the Shadow Crystals being controlled by a third party in the form of Gaster or someone else is so versatile of an option that I have no choice but to keep it on the list. I personally don't find this option particularly compelling, but I cannot deny that it is a viable possibility. 
Next up is The Crystals Show The Past. This option fits almost every single piece of evidence. Susie was angry and cold in Chapter 1, so this vision is an accurate depiction of the past. The empty classroom and computer lab were regular rooms before becoming dark worlds, so once again, this fits the bill as a vision of the past. The whole deal with the crystal not showing anything in the castle town is a little hard to explain, but it could be showing that the castle town and or supply closet haven't always existed. Or it could just be that it's showing a vision of the supply closet while it's too dark to see. Again, the lack of a vision for the castle town is a hole, but it's a hole in most theories. And lastly, the vision of Chris seeing right through their hand could make sense in a number of ways. It could have some profound meaning in which it reveals that Chris hasn't always existed and was artificially added to this timeline. Or in a much more mundane option, it could simply be pointing out that Chris hasn't always lived in the hometown. Remember that Chris is a human and was thus adopted by the Dreamer family. As such, there was a point in the past where Chris didn't live in this town and thus wouldn't be part of this town's history. This theory also works for explaining how Jevil and Spampton were driven mad, as it's entirely possible that the crystal, by showing some specific vision from the past, revealed a terrible secret that drove Jevil and Spampton insane. So far, this theory seems to make perfect sense. However, where this option hits a roadblock is with the combat effectiveness. Knowing things about the past isn't particularly helpful in a direct fight. Like, maybe I could use it to study my opponent's fighting style or something, but that requires a lot of effort and research ahead of time and wouldn't be useful in all circumstances. Furthermore, since it doesn't let you see the future, you'd have no way of knowing who you'd be fighting ahead of time, which means you'd have no way to know that you should research that specific person in preparation for that battle. Overall, the crystal showing the past makes sense with most of the evidence, but due to its inconsistent usefulness in combat situations, I can't call this option perfect by any means. I won't remove it from the list, as it does meet almost every requirement, but it definitely has a notable flaw. Next up is the crystals show the future. This option is interesting, as it makes sense in many ways, but also relies on a great deal of speculation. For starters, the Cyber World and Card Kingdom visions showing their Light World counterparts works perfectly with this theory, as it's a fact that these Dark Worlds were then sealed and turned back into normal rooms a short time after these visions were had. However, every other vision only makes sense if it's visions of things that have yet to occur. Seeing Susie angrily glaring at Chris would suggest that Chris is going to have a falling out with Susie. And while that's not entirely unreasonable, Susie has had falling outs with her friends before, it's still a bit hard to imagine Susie turning on Chris. A more feasible option is the idea that Susie isn't glaring at Chris, but is actually glaring at the player, or at whoever is possessing Chris. But even that option has some issues, as it doesn't really make sense for Susie to glare coldly. If Susie has just found out that Chris has been possessed by some other entity, wouldn't she be furious? Why would she be giving us the cold shoulder instead of going full rage mode? In short, it's not impossible for Susie to have a falling out with Chris, but I have my reservations. And then there's the vision of Chris seeing through their hand. This would imply that at some point in the near future, Chris will no longer exist or will no longer be present. This option also feels somewhat hard to believe, as while I'm convinced that some pretty horrible stuff will be happening in this game, I don't really believe that they would kill Chris. It's not impossible, but again, I have my reservations. And then there's the matter of Ralsei's castle town. 
The fact that there's no vision of this town suggests that, much like Chris, this dark world will no longer exist in the future. However, if that is the case, why doesn't it just show the supply closet? The castle town continues to be puzzling. All that said, while I have my reservations on this interpretation of the visions, where this theory really shines is with regards to its combat effectiveness. Having the ability to see the future is a massive advantage in combat, and would live up to Shom's claim that defeating someone with a Shadow Crystal is no small feat. This would also further explain how Jevil and Spamton were driven mad. If they saw that the roaring was inevitable, and that it would bring some horrible future, that could very well drive them to insanity. As such, overall, the crystal showing the future is one of the stronger explanations. As it explains some of the visions in a convincing manner, it's extremely useful in combat, and it explains why Jevil and Spamton became the way they are. I personally have some issues with the implications of this theory, especially with regards to how it depicts Susie and Chris, but me disliking something does not make it untrue. As such, I'll be keeping this theory on the list. Next up is The Crystal Show Alternate Timelines. This theory is basically a combination of the past and future theories, but with the extra bit of ambiguity caused by it being in a different timeline than the main game. I won't go too in-depth with this one, as it's literally just a more flexible version of the two theories we just covered, but I will point out that it's a little bit more dubious that this version of the Shadow Crystals would actually benefit you in combat. With seeing the future, you know what your opponent is going to do. But with seeing an alternate timeline, you have no way of knowing how close that timeline is to your own timeline. So how helpful it would actually be in a fight is debatable. That said, thanks to this version of the Shadow Crystals showing a non-canon timeline of Deltarune, it allows me to gloss over the more dubious elements of the past and future theory. Namely, Susie having a falling out with Chris doesn't seem likely in this timeline, but it could definitely happen to a different version of Susie in a different timeline. In short, this theory has most of the same strengths and weaknesses of the past and future theories, so I'll keep it on the list. Next up is The Crystals Show a World Where Chris Doesn't Exist. This is basically a much more narrow version of the alternate timeline theory, as instead of showing just any alternate timeline, it is specifically showing what the main Deltarune world would be like without Chris. This is most obviously supported by the vision through Chris's hand, as it makes sense that they wouldn't be able to see their hand in a world where they don't exist. This also makes some sense for Susie's vision, as Chris is responsible for Susie's character progression, so if Chris didn't exist, then it stands to reason that Susie would still be angry and cold like she was in Chapter 1. However, where this option gets especially speculative is with the Dark World visions. The implications of this theory is that you see nothing for the castle town and see the computer lab and unused classroom for the other dark worlds because these dark worlds would not exist in a world without Chris. This, in turn, implies that either Chris is the knight and is thus the one who created these dark worlds, or it is implying that Chris is responsible for the knight's existence. Either way, those are some pretty major plot twists that need to be true in order for this theory to make sense. And then there's the problem of combat effectiveness. Seeing a world where Chris doesn't exist seems pretty useless for making you a better fighter. Even if Jevil and Spamton instead saw visions of a world where they didn't exist, that still wouldn't make them better at fighting. 
It also doesn't really make sense for explaining how Jevo and Spamton were driven insane. Seeing a world where Chris doesn't exist would obviously have no impact on them, and seeing a world where they don't exist, while perhaps a little disturbing in a goner kid kind of way, isn't terrifying enough to drive someone completely insane. Overall, the theory that the crystal is showing a world where Chris doesn't exist makes some sense with the light world visions, but it relies on some pretty major plot twists being true in order for the dark world visions to make sense, it doesn't benefit the wielder in combat, and it doesn't explain Jevil and Spamton's madness. As such, while a somewhat compelling idea, I don't think this option quite hits the mark, so I'll be scratching it off the list. Next up is The Crystals Show a World Where Darkness Doesn't Exist. This is very similar to the last theory, but with darkness instead of Chris. The main evidence comes from the Dark World visions, as seeing their Light World counterparts makes sense if you're seeing a version of this world without darkness. Similarly, without the Dark World, Susie and Chris would never have become friends, which means she would still be her old angry self. It also makes sense that the castle town doesn't show anything, as that dark world is made from pure darkness, and thus it has nothing to replace it in a world without darkness. Where this theory becomes speculative is with the Chris vision, as this implies that Chris doesn't exist in a world without darkness. You could either argue that this is revealing some crazy plot twist where Chris is secretly a darkener or something like that, or you could argue that Chris would be dead if they hadn't found the Dark World. This logic seemingly relies on Chris having encountered a Dark World before, which we have no evidence of, but if you wanted to get dramatic, you could argue that the Dark World existing is responsible for Chris making their first true friend in Susie, and that in a timeline without that friendship, Chris would have ended their own life out of loneliness. This entire explanation is heavily speculative, but it's not impossible. However, where this option falls short is in combat. Seeing a world without darkness would provide no benefit in a fight, and furthermore, there's no clear reason why this version of the Shadow Crystals would drive Jevil and Spamton insane. As such, much like the last theory, the theory that the crystals show a world without darkness relies on some major speculation, provides no combat benefit, and shows no clear reason for why they drive Spamton and Jevil insane. As such, I'll be knocking this one off the list as well. Side note, another theory I saw was the idea of the crystals showing a world without determination, but it had most of the same shortcomings as the world without darkness theory, so I didn't bother listing it. Next up is the crystals let you see through darkness. This idea is most supported by the Dark World visions, as you see through the darkness in order to see their light world counterparts. However, where this option falls flat is in the light world, as there is theoretically no darkness here, which means that there really shouldn't be any special vision provided by the crystal. The only way this makes sense is if you interpret the light world visions as being metaphorical or something like that, but even then, I can't really see how seeing through darkness would show a vision of Susie glaring coldly. The vision of Chris seeing through their hand only makes sense if, once again, we assume Chris is a darkener of some sort, which is obviously a pretty crazy plot twist. And then there's the matter of combat effectiveness. It's very unclear to me how being able to see through darkness would make you a better fighter, especially if all you'd see is the light world if you're fighting in the dark world. Furthermore, how would that vision cause Jevil and Spamton to go insane? 
it only really makes sense if they saw some horrible secret in the light world by using the crystals. But even then, the idea of the crystals allowing you to see through darkness seems to contradict this line from Spamton, in which he says that he wants to finally see past the dark. If he already had a crystal that let him do that, then it doesn't make sense for him to say this line. Overall, this theory doesn't really make sense for the light world visions, it doesn't provide any combat benefit, and it seems to contradict one of the lines said by Spamton. As such, I'll be knocking this one off the list. Next up is The Crystals Let You See Through Illusions. This idea is interesting at first glance, but it honestly doesn't really make sense once you give it any analysis. This theory implies that the dark worlds are illusions, and while I know the theory that Deltarune is just kids playing Dungeons and Dragons is popular, I don't think it really makes any sense now that Chapter 2 has come out, which makes the idea of these worlds being illusions hard to believe. It also doesn't make any sense why Susie would be perceived as glaring coldly, as that would imply that her liking Chris is an act, which I don't believe, and it would also suddenly be granting the crystal the ability to read people's minds, which is a totally different theory. Furthermore, this theory would imply that Chris is an illusion, and that's why they see through their hand, which is quite possibly the most insane idea I've ever heard. Even if we interpret this as being metaphorical, and that this vision actually means that Chris having free will is an illusion, that's still a pretty big leap. Then there's the matter of this item being useful in combat. Seeing through illusions could be useful in some contexts, but unless you're fighting a person who uses illusions, which most people don't, I can't really see this explanation making much sense. You could argue that seeing through illusion is what allowed Jevil and Spampton to see whatever horrible truth is responsible for driving them mad, which actually makes sense, but I'm afraid that's not really enough to fix the multiple issues this theory has. As such, due to this theory requiring some extremely dubious plot twists to even remotely make sense, and due to its less than consistent combat usefulness, I'll be knocking this one off the list. Next up is The Crystals Show The Goner World. This theory holds that there is a third world that exists in Deltarune in addition to the light and dark worlds, the Goner world. The Goner world is where Gaster, the Goners, and this intro sequence with the Goner Maker supposedly take place, and this theory states that the Shadow Crystals allow you to see into this hypothetical world. I assume that this goner world is basically a sort of Twilight Zone version of the light world, where nobody exists, as that's the only way to explain these visions of the empty classroom and computer lab. It also makes sense that Chris would see through their own hand, as obviously Chris does not currently reside in this goner world. However, it doesn't really make sense that you'd see a vision of Susie glaring coldly, unless you are implying that there is a goner version of Susie that exists in this goner world, which has no evidence, even if it does sound kinda interesting. And then there's the issue of combat effectiveness. Seeing into this goner world doesn't really seem all that helpful unless these goners are somehow able to give you hints and advice to help you fight your opponent. It would sort of be like having Navi from Ocarina of Time giving you hints, but instead of Navi, it's Gaster, which is a pretty hilarious visual. <laughs> And as for driving Jevil and Spamton insane, if these visions of this goner world allowed them to interact with Gaster, then it's possible that this could have led to some unknown revelations that caused their insanity. 
Overall, the biggest issue with this theory is it relies on this goner world existing despite there being no evidence in Undertale or Deltarune of such a place. Whenever we encountered Gaster or Goners, it was always in the regular world. Frisk didn't stumble into some alternate realm. Furthermore, this theory not only relies on this goner world existing despite the lack of evidence, it also relies on there being a goner version of Susie and it relies on Gaster somehow giving useful combat advice, which is just so many baseless assumptions and unprovable ideas that I can't really get behind it. It's not impossible, but I can't really support a theory that, as of right now, seems to have next to no evidence in its favor. I do appreciate the creativity, though. This is a cool way to integrate the goners into the main story, even if I don't actually believe this theory is correct. Next up is the crystals show a world where the player doesn't exist. This is one of the more puzzling theories. This is implying that the Dark Worlds wouldn't exist, Chris wouldn't be here, and Susie wouldn't have had her character arc if the player wasn't involved in this timeline. This seems like an extremely dubious concept for one reason. The player doesn't take control until the very start of chapter one. And due to our choices not mattering, even our involvement is incapable of altering this story. As such, if we can't stop Susie and Chris from becoming friends, that means this vision of Susie still being angry and cold doesn't make sense. And since Chris exists in this world prior to our involvement, they should continue to exist in a world without us, which means this Chris hand vision also doesn't make sense. Similarly, it doesn't really make sense how seeing a world free of the player's influence would give anyone an advantage in combat. You could argue that this theory explains Jevil and Spamton's insanity as it could potentially reveal to them that the player exists, but that doesn't make up for the fact that the visions do not agree with this theory in the slightest. As such, I'll be removing this theory from the list. Next up is the crystals show a higher layer of reality. This idea holds that the Dark World visions are showing the Light World, while the Light World visions are showing some other layer of existence that is even higher up than the Light World. This theory is supported by the Dark World visions, but the Light World visions are a lot more dubious. Chris seeing through their own hand makes sense as they don't live in this theoretical higher layer of existence, but the Susie vision really doesn't add up. If this theory was correct, then that would imply there's some angry version of Susie that exists on a higher layer of reality, which is basically the goner theory all over again. And like that theory, I find the idea of there being multiple versions of Susie running around rather hard to believe. Furthermore, since I have no way of knowing who or what lives in this hypothetical higher reality, I have no way of knowing if seeing visions of this place would help you in combat. Once again, it's conceivable that visions of heaven or whatever this higher layer of reality is could be enough to drive Jevil and Spamton insane, but it doesn't fix the problems with this theory. So, much like the Goner World theory, I'll be knocking this theory off the list. Next up is The Crystals Show Nothing, and it's all in Chris's head. This theory is decently unique, and it has the potential to be fairly convincing, as theoretically, all of these visions could be things Chris was thinking about at the time. However, while theoretically feasible, it doesn't really hold up to scrutiny, as it doesn't really make sense that Chris would have so few visions. 
like if the crystal showed a different vision depending on where you are and what part of the story you're in, then that could feasibly prove that the crystals are showing what's on Chris's mind. However, since they only show these few visions, that seems to pretty much confirm that this is not how they work. Like, would Chris really be constantly thinking about how the Card Kingdom is an unused classroom? Would Chris even know that this is the case? How could Chris possibly be thinking about this? Similarly, why wouldn't there be any vision of Ralsei's castle town if this is all in Chris's head anyways? With the other theories, you could argue that the shadow crystals don't work while so close to the Grand Fountain, but if the visions are all in Chris's head, then it should show something, so the fact that it doesn't hurts this theory even more. And lastly, this theory completely falls apart when it comes to Jevil and Spamton, as it basically argues that the crystals have no real powers, which means not only would it not help you in combat, but it also wouldn't drive you insane. This theory that the visions are all in Chris's head only really works if you're going off the theory that none of these dark worlds are real and it's all just a game being played by children. If you believe that, sure, maybe this theory would make sense. But I personally don't buy into that, so I will be knocking the it's all in Chris's head theory off the list. Side note, a slight variant on this theory is the idea that it's not all in Chris's head, but the crystals still only show you your own thoughts. But that option also doesn't make sense for the same reasons. Next up is the crystal show that your choices don't matter. This theory is interesting, as it ties into Deltarune's main theme. The idea with this is that these visions are meant to show you how futile your actions are, and how destiny is predetermined, and thus your choices don't matter. The Dark World visions show the unused classroom and the computer lab in order to show that no matter what you do, the Cyber World and Card Kingdom will always be sealed. The Light World vision shows a hole in Chris's hand in order to show that no matter what you do, Chris will die or disappear or something along those lines. And it shows Susie glaring coldly because despite your efforts to reform her, she will inevitably have a falling out with Chris that leads to their friendship falling apart. This theory also works for explaining how it drove Spamton and Jevil insane as the revelation that their choices don't matter and that they can't control their own destiny would definitely do some damage to their psyche. However, the biggest hole in this theory is the fact that a crystal that tells you how pointless your actions are isn't going to help you in a fight. Furthermore, while this theory works within the limits of the visions, it relies on some pretty big assumptions when it comes to what is going to happen to Susie and Chris in the future. As such, while a stronger contender than many of the other theories we've discussed, I think the lack of usefulness in a fight is too big of a flaw to overlook, so I'll be knocking this one off the list. Next up is The Crystals Show What You Fear. This is primarily supported by the Suzy vision, as it makes sense that Chris would be afraid of losing their only real friend. The rest of the visions are more speculative, but they still make some sense. Chris seeing through their hand could be in reference to them being afraid of losing themselves to whatever entity is possessing them. Or maybe it's just that they're afraid they're going to die or disappear. As for the Dark World visions, the idea of Chris being afraid of turning these Dark Worlds back into their Light World counterparts could make some amount of sense, as Chris gets more friends and power and importance in the Dark World than the Light World. However, the fact that Chris could see a vision of the toys strewn on the ground despite not knowing they were in a dark world created from the unused classroom doesn't really add up. Unless Chris is the knight and is thus responsible for the creation of this dark world, them knowing what the light world counterpart looks like doesn't quite add up. 
Similarly, seeing what you fear wouldn't really help you in a fight. Although, being forced to come face to face with your worst fears could definitely cause Jevil or Spamton to go a little bonkers. Still, the lack of combat usefulness, combined with the somewhat dubious interpretations of the Dark World visions, inclines me to scratch this option off the list. Next up is the crystals show your memories. This idea actually works quite well with the visions we're given thus far. Chris has been to the computer lab and attends the school, so it's conceivable that they have memories of the unused classroom. They also could easily be remembering how Susie glared at them near the start of Chapter 1. The only somewhat confusing vision is the one where Chris sees through their hand, but you could argue that this is in reference to Chris not being native to this town. Admittedly, that explanation doesn't make perfect sense, but I'd be willing to overlook that small issue if it weren't for the more major issues with this theory. Namely, seeing your own memories would not make you a better fighter, and seeing your own memories would not drive you insane. As such, while a more conceivable option than some, memory theory still has too many issues to remain on this list. Next up is The Crystals Show Dreams. This idea is rather dubious, as it's somewhat hard to understand whose dreams these visions are supposed to represent. If they are Chris's dreams, then does that mean they've dreamt about the unused classroom and computer lab? What about seeing through their own hand, or Susie glaring at them? And if these are other people's dreams, then whose dreams are they? Furthermore, how exactly could seeing someone's dreams help you beat them in a fight? Like, just because I saw that Noelle dreamt about Susie doesn't make it any easier to fight her. It could be conceivable that Jevil and Spamton were exposed to some horrific nightmare that is responsible for their madness, but I find the majority of the evidence for this theory to be dubious at best and non-existent at worst. Even if we interpret dreams to mean things we'd like to see happen in the world, that still doesn't seem useful in combat, and it seems even less likely to drive someone insane. As such, while somewhat interesting, I'll be knocking this theory off the list as well. Next up is The Crystals Show Broken Dreams. This is a variation on the last theory in which, instead of showing people's desires, it shows the dreams that they've given up on or dreams that have been dashed. While somewhat dramatic, I'm not sure how this applies to the visions. Like, you could argue that Chris seeing Susie glaring could be a broken dream, but she's still friends with them, so that dream isn't broken yet. Similarly, what does the unused classroom and computer lab visions have to do with broken dreams? Is it talking about the dreams of the queen and king? If so, why would it show their broken dreams? And God only knows how this theory is supposed to explain the vision of Chris seeing through their own hand. Furthermore, while it's conceivable that this could drive someone insane in the right context, it definitely doesn't seem useful in combat. As such, while a more dramatic variant on the dream theory, it doesn't really make any more sense. So off the list it goes. Next up is The Crystals Show Camera Angles. This is a bit of a meta theory, as it holds that the crystals are the camera angles that the player is using to view the game. So it's not that there's real cameras, but rather a game mechanic that represents the player's point of view, and the crystals show things from that perspective. So the empty classroom and computer lab visions are just showing what we see when we enter those rooms. Exactly how this works when it comes to the Chris and Susie visions, I'm not sure. 
we don't see through Chris, so that doesn't quite make sense, and as the player, we can't really see Susie's face during the time when she was glaring at Chris, as her hair covered her face on her sprite. That said, being able to get a third-person perspective could absolutely give someone a benefit in a fight, as that gives you a better overview of the battlefield. Similarly, if using these crystals allowed you to see something horrible, or to realize that the player exists, then that could drive someone insane. Overall, I appreciate the creativity of this theory, as it is rather unique, but I don't think it quite makes sense with the visions that we see in the light world, and it also raises the question of why we are seeing such specific camera angles. The player is able to see far more angles than just these few. So, yeah, off the list for this one. Next up is the crystals show what will happen on the weird route. This idea is interesting, as it's a variation on the alternate timeline theory. This theory works for the dark world visions, as those dark worlds are indeed sealed and turned back into regular rooms in the weird route. Furthermore, if any route is going to end with Chris being killed or destroyed, it would be this route, so us seeing through their hand adds up as well. And of course, given the horrors Chris inflicts on those around them in the weird route, it makes sense that Susie would have a falling out with them, so this vision of her glaring also adds up. You could even argue that seeing the more horrific elements of the weird route is responsible for driving these two jokers insane. However, the one problem with this theory, and the one that keeps me from finding it too compelling, is the fact that it has no perceivable usefulness in a combat situation. Why would seeing a timeline where people are getting murdered make you a more dangerous combatant? Maybe this is implying that seeing such a timeline would inspire you to become stronger, but that's a pretty roundabout way for the crystals to make you more powerful. As such, while an interesting and unique idea, Weird Route Theory is extremely speculative, it never shows any visions of Noelle, despite her importance for the Weird Route, and it has no obvious usefulness in combat. So I think I'll knock this theory off the list. Side note, I did see another theory that held that the crystals showed visions of the worst possible timeline. However, that theory has pretty much all of the same strengths and weaknesses as the Weird Route theory. Next up is the crystals show whatever is most likely to drive you insane. This theory is interesting, as it's the first theory to be primarily supported by Jevil and Spamton's madness. However, while that part definitely contributes to this theory, the rest of the evidence really doesn't. There's no reason to think seeing the empty classroom or computer lab would drive Chris insane, and while seeing Susie glaring at them and seeing through their hand might be mildly upsetting, that's not nearly enough to cause madness. Furthermore, a crystal that shows you things that would drive you insane seems pretty useless in combat. In fact, if I looked at a crystal before fighting someone and that crystal showed me something horrific, that would probably make me less capable of fighting them. As such, while I respect the creativity, I don't think this theory can stay on the list. Next up is the crystals show the core of things. This theory makes a decent amount of sense with regards to the dark world visions, as you could certainly argue that the core of these dark worlds were the computer lab and unused classroom. Similarly, since Chris's core is their soul, it makes at least a little bit of sense that their hand wouldn't show anything, as their core doesn't reside in their hand. You could also argue that seeing the core of your enemy would make it easier to defeat them in a fight. Furthermore, if Jevil or Spamton were made to look at the core of something horrific, then that could totally drive them insane. 
The problem with this theory, and it is a pretty major problem, is the vision of Susie glaring coldly at Chris. This theory implies that Susie, underneath it all, is still just a cold, angry person who may not even like Chris. To be frank, this feels like such an unfair characterization of Susie that I think it damages this theory substantially. I would argue that Susie's core was never that of a cold, angry person, and that this behavior was always just an act. Acting cool and tough when you're actually insecure is super common, and definitely something I think Susie suffers from. As such, the idea of her core being cold and angry just doesn't ring true. So, while a decently reasonable theory for the most part, I think the implications for the Susie vision are too unreasonable to be valid. So, I'll be knocking core theory off the list. Next up is The Crystals Show the Undertale Timeline. This one's kinda cool. The idea seems to be that these visions are showing the Undertale timeline sometime after the true pacifist route. The Dark Worlds just show the computer lab and unused classroom because Dark Worlds don't exist in Undertale, and it shows a hole in Chris's hand because Undertale has a Frisk instead of a Chris. And of course, since Frisk never had the chance to meet Susie, that means Susie never got her character arc, and thus she's still cold and angry in that timeline. The problem with this theory is that it provides no conceivable combat benefit. Seeing Alphys and Undyne smooching on a beach isn't going to make fighting my opponent any easier. And while it's not inconceivable that Jevil and Spamton might accidentally see something horrible in the Undertale timeline that drives them mad, it's pretty dubious, as most of the more horrific things are gone by the end of True Pacifist. Overall, while a neat idea that matches most of the visions, the Undertale theory relies on a number of assumptions while providing no believable combat benefit, and thus, sadly, must be scratched off the list. And the final theory on this list is the crystals show good things in the dark world and bad things in the light world. This theory mostly relies on the light world visions, as seeing a hole in Chris's hand and seeing a glaring Susie both definitely seem like bad things. However, the idea that these visions of the classroom and computer lab are inherently good visions seems rather dubious. Given how much these characters prefer the dark world over the light world, you could easily argue that these particular visions are actually the opposite of good in Chris's eyes. Furthermore, I'm a big fan of Occam's Razor when it comes to theory crafting, so any theory that argues that the Shadow Crystals work differently in different contexts are going to have a harder time convincing me unless they make perfect sense. And unfortunately, this theory doesn't really pull that off. Seeing good things might conceivably give you some sort of combat benefit, but it definitely wouldn't drive you insane. And if the good things are as vague and useless as these two visions, then I can't really see them helping you win any fights. Overall, the dark good light bad theory is both too vague and too convoluted, while also not really explaining a lot of the evidence. As such, it will also be scratched off the list. That's every single Shadow Crystal theory analyzed, and after all that culling, we've narrowed down the list to these five theories. Truth theory, third party theory, past theory, future theory, and alternate timeline theory. It makes sense that these theories are the ones that stood up to scrutiny, as these were also the most popular theories that I saw in the community. 
However, while we've narrowed down the list, we still haven't found one specific theory to rule them all. So we need to narrow down the list even further, which means we need to look at even more evidence. Thus far, I've tried to focus on the evidence that is most well understood. However, in order to dig deeper into this mystery, we need to tap into some of the more obscure and mysterious pieces of evidence. Specifically, within the game files of Deltarune, there is data for several items that don't actually appear in the game. There are two unused items that are relevant to our investigation. The first is the Pure Crystal. This item is only mentioned once in-game when it is shown as an item needed to craft the Twisted Sword in Malleus' shop. If we look into the game files, we can find this description of the Pure Crystal. The Shadow Purified by the Cat. Now, this almost certainly confirms that the Pure Crystal is a purified version of the Shadow Crystal, which is why it's important for this video. As for who this cat is, there are several cats in Deltarune, including potentially Spamton? But the most likely cat that this could be referring to is Shom, as not only are they a cat, but they're also the only character to talk about the Shadow Crystals. Furthermore, Shom specifically says that they can stitch together something incredible for us if we bring them Shadow Crystals, so it's quite possible that the incredible thing they're talking about is this pure crystal. This, in turn, may be suggesting that the pure crystal is what's created when you combine multiple shadow crystals. That conclusion is uncertain, however, as it's possible that Shom intends to use the shadow crystals to make some other item altogether. Still, the existence of this pure crystal can potentially tell us more about the shadow crystals. You see, the word pure is an interesting term. In the context of fantasy, or good versus evil stories, pure would typically refer to the good guys. Similarly, shadow would typically be a concept associated with the bad guys. As such, a surface-level reading of this item would suggest that this is somehow a good version of a Shadow Crystal. However, the issue with this interpretation is that not only are Darkness and Shadow not considered a bad thing in Deltarune, but more importantly, the Shadow Crystals are only referred to as Shadow Crystals because they cast a shadow. It has nothing to do with what they are, or whether they're good or evil. So I don't think the good versus evil reading of the word pure actually makes sense. So if we're not talking about good and evil, then what could pure mean in this context? Well, let's look at the dictionary definition. Pure means not mixed or adulterated with any other substances or material. A second definition is without any extraneous and unnecessary elements, while a third definition is free of contamination. And if we look at the definition of crystal, it reads, a piece of homogeneous solid substance having a natural, geometrically regular form with symmetrically arranged planar faces. Uh, alternatively, a crystal definition with more relevance to our topic is highly transparent glass with a high refractive index. As such, the literal reading of pure crystal is a piece of highly transparent glass that is free of any extraneous or unnecessary elements. Given this definition, we can deduce that shadow crystals are flawed, contaminated, or otherwise imperfect versions of pure crystals. As such, it seems that in order for a shadow crystal theory to make sense, it needs to explain what a pure crystal is and how it functions as a more pure version of a shadow crystal. 
Unfortunately, while I'd like to say this revelation pushes us closer to understanding the Shadow Crystals, it actually really doesn't. You see, no matter which of these theories is true, they all have one fact in common. The Shadow Crystals only give you a brief glimpse of a vision before they stop working. The visions are so brief that Chris wonders if it was just their imagination. As such, you could easily argue that, in all of these theories, the Shadow Crystal is a flawed version of a pure crystal simply because they only work for a brief moment before malfunctioning. This explanation of what makes a pure crystal pure may or may not be true, but because it works for all of these theories, our newfound knowledge of the pure crystal fails to narrow down the theory list, which is disappointing. Thankfully, there's one final piece of evidence that we can use that may save this analysis. The Twisted Sword. The Twisted Sword is created using a pure crystal, which means that if we can figure out what this sword is and what its purpose is, we should be able to use that information to better understand the pure crystals and, by extension, the shadow crystals. So, what is the Twisted Sword? Well, it's created using the pure crystal and the thorn ring. The Thorn Ring, of course, is the special item that Noel can only get in the Weird Route, so creating the Twisted Sword would require you to complete a significant portion of that route, which already makes this item dark and nefarious by its very nature. Even the Twisted name sounds unpleasant. In the files, you can also see Susie, Ralsei, and Noelle's reaction to the Twisted Sword, with all of them seeming scared and unnerved by it, with the exception of Ralsei, who says it looks like a spiral. The idea of a spiral sword reminds me of the Fierce Deity Sword from Zelda, or the Coiled Sword from Dark Souls. Either way, the name of the weapon being the Twisted Sword makes a lot of sense if it's shaped like a spiral. The weapon gives 16 attack, which is the highest attack boost of any item, and it has the Trance effect. Trance is the status given to Noel by the Thorn Ring, which further supports the notion that the Twisted Sword is meant to fill a similar role. In other words, it seems highly likely that the Twisted Sword will be used by someone in some sort of Snowgrave-style route in a future chapter. However, the fact that you need the Pure Crystal in order to create this weapon seems to confirm that in order to do a full weird route across the entire game, you'll need to defeat the secret bosses and collect their Shadow Crystals. Now, that's all fine and interesting, but how does this help us narrow down our theory list? Well, here's the thing. Whatever visions these shadow crystals show, they must show a better or more complete or more consistent version of those visions when they become a pure crystal. And whatever visions this pure crystal gives must be necessary for accomplishing a Snowgrave style route, as that is the only reason we would insist on combining the pure crystal with the Thorn Ring. Recall that the main purpose of the Thorn Ring was to reduce the TP cost of ice spells, which was the only way for Noel to cast Snowgrave on Birdly. In other words, the Thorn Ring was a weapon that needed to exist in order for us to kill a specific target. As such, it stands to reason that this twisted sword must also be necessary for killing some specific person in a future chapter. As such, what this tells us is that the visions given by the Shadow Crystals are not just useful in combat, they are outright necessary if you want to kill certain opponents. So, 
Let's take a look back at these theories and see which ones could consistently give us a significant advantage when it comes to killing someone. First is the truth theory, and I think this theory is the first one to go to the chopping block. I mentioned before that I found this theory dubious because it relied on the interpretation that the truth was that Susie secretly hated Chris, which didn't make sense to me. I allowed this theory to stay on the list because this reading of Susie was theoretically possible, even if it was unlikely, but it also had the issue of not being particularly useful in combat. Why would seeing Susie glaring angrily make it any easier to fight her? It's all very hard to buy. If this theory was correct, then it would rely on the assumption that whoever we are going to kill with the twisted sword is someone who we would need to see the truth of in order to eliminate them. That's a fine concept on paper, especially if they use tricks or illusions to cover up their weaknesses, but the issue is that this theory has consistently underperformed when it comes to the logic. Sure, true theory makes sense most of the time, but at this stage of our analysis, I don't think it's good enough for a theory to only make sense most of the time. The visions given by the crystals need to be consistently and believably explained, they need to provide a clear benefit in combat, they preferably need to show how Jevil and Spampton were driven mad, and now it needs to show a way to kill an opponent who otherwise we would be unable to kill. While the truth theory could potentially do all these things, it can't do it consistently or convincingly. The vision of Susie is particularly unbelievable, and the combat usefulness is questionable at best. As such, while definitely one of the strongest theories I've seen, I don't think truth theory is as consistent and convincing as it needs to be in order to meaningfully outperform these other theories. Next is the third party theory. This theory was one I didn't personally love, as it's so vague, but the crystals being controlled by some unknown intelligent entity gives this theory such versatility that it was easily able to fit in with all the evidence. That fact continues to be the case now, as you could easily argue that whatever entity is controlling the crystals might have secret knowledge that would aid you in killing other otherwise unkillable characters, which means this theory works with the Twisted Sword as well. As such, I'll be keeping this theory on the list. Next is the Past Theory. This option made perfect sense for the Visions, as all of these things could make sense to have occurred in the past, and it could even explain what drove Jevil and Spampton insane. However, the big problem with this theory was the lack of clear usefulness in combat, and unfortunately, that problem only grows more prominent now that it needs to be a necessary component of the Twisted Sword. I let that problem slip before, but now that we're at this stage of the analysis, I can't excuse it. The situations in which seeing into the past could help you in a fight are so few and far between that I can't confidently say this theory works perfectly, which is what I'm going to need to fully accept it. So off the list, it has to go. Next is the future theory. This theory, as you'll recall, worked perfectly with most of the evidence, as several of the visions could convincingly be depicting the future, this power would definitely make you more effective in combat, and there could absolutely be a future that would drive Spamton and Jevil insane. The main issue I took with this theory was that it implied Chris would die or disappear and that Susie would have a falling out with us, neither of which I believe will happen. 
However, while I may have my personal gripes, that doesn't change the fact that these events could absolutely happen. And since seeing the future would absolutely make it easier to kill an unpredictable opponent, this theory works perfectly with the Twisted Sword. As such, the future theory fits with all the evidence we've seen thus far, which means I'll keep it on the list. Lastly is the alternate timeline theory. This theory, as you'll recall, has most of the advantages of the past and future theories, although I would argue that it is slightly different. Namely, I'd say this theory works better with the visions, as I'm more willing to accept Chris dying and Susie having a falling out if it's happening in an alternate timeline. However, I would also argue that this theory works slightly worse when it comes to the Twisted Sword. Being able to see the immediate future clearly had usefulness in combat, as you could know exactly what your opponent was going to do. But seeing alternate timelines is slightly more convoluted. You'd have to look into an alternate timeline that's identical to this one, with the only difference being what Chris was going to do next. You'd then have to observe what your alternate self was going to do, and see if it works. If it works, you copy them, and if not, you'd have to look at a different timeline and try again. So, for example, let's say you were using the Twisted Sword, and you looked into a timeline where Chris stabs upward, and you see the attack misses. You'd now know not to attack upwards. You'd then look into a timeline where Chris stabs downward, and the attack lands, which would tell you that you should also attack downwards. That's just an example, but you get the idea. It's basically the same as the future theory, but with a few extra steps. It's not impossible, and it might even work automatically once the crystal is transformed into the Twisted Sword. But you can see what I mean when I say it's a tad more convoluted than just seeing the future. Still, it works with the evidence, so I'll keep it on the list. And with that, we've narrowed the options down to just three theories. That's one-tenth of the options we had at the start of this video, so we've definitely made some progress. It seems, based off the evidence we've seen thus far, that the most likely theories to be true are the third-party theory, the future theory, and the alternate timeline theory. Since two out of three options have to do with seeing through time, that seems like a likely functionality of the crystals. In fact, it's possible that the third party theory relies on seeing through time as well. For all we know, this person controlling the crystals may also rely on seeing through time in order to provide us with these visions. So that means all of the remaining options have an above of average chance to be time oriented. However, sadly, I'm afraid I am unable to narrow down the options any further without straying into territory that is more hypothetical. Thus far, I've tried to keep this analysis as grounded as possible, as I know some of you are more invested in the down-to-earth analysis than you are in my own theories, as my theories tend to be rather speculative and think outside the box instead of relying exclusively on confirmed evidence. However, I don't think the objective analysis can extend much further than this. I've covered all the hard evidence we have, which leaves us with not much more to discuss. Now, I know what you're thinking, but Jaru, what about the Shadow Mantle? And you're right, I haven't discussed that yet. However, not only do we have no confirmation that the Shadow Mantle is tied to the Shadow Crystals, but even if it were, it's sadly too mysterious to narrow down our list. Still, I know you guys want me to talk about it, so I will, as it is an interesting item in its own right. 
The name Shadow Mantle may seem rather confusing at first glance. We all know what shadow means, but most of us don't hear the word mantle very often, and thus you might not even know what a mantle is. The dictionary definition of mantle is a loose sleeveless cloak or shawl worn especially by women. The term can also be in reference to an important role or responsibility, but since Shaum specifically mentions that it's some sort of cloth, we can conclude the first definition is what's being used here. The only real information we have on what the Shadow Mantle actually is, or what it does, comes from Shaum saying that without it, we would have no chance of defeating the secret boss of Chapter 3. Unfortunately, we don't know anything about this enemy, as the secret bosses are never hinted at prior to their reveal. We hear no hint about Jevil until we stumble across him, and the same is true for Spamton. As such, it's not really possible to deduce anything about this next secret boss at this point in time, which makes the importance of the Shadow Mantle unclear. However, we can make some deductions. If we assume the Shadow Mantle has nothing to do with the Shadow Crystals, then we'd have to figure out why it's tied to shadows. The most obvious explanation, especially in a fantasy setting like this, is that the Shadow Mantle is some sort of invisibility cloak, and thus Sean believes that we can't defeat the next secret boss if that boss is able to see us. That said, while we don't know the Shadow Mantle is tied to the Shadow Crystals, it seems like there's a good chance that it is, as not only does it also have the word Shadow in its title, but it's also brought up by Sham, who is the only character to openly discuss the Shadow Crystals thus far. In fact, Sham only brings up the Shadow Mantle if you bring them both Shadow Crystals which could be proof that these items are connected. If they are connected, then it's possible that this mantle is a cloak that has shadow crystals stitched into the fabric. Although, interestingly, since the crystals are invisible, this cloak would end up looking like any other normal piece of clothing. Sham might even hint at this with this line, where they say, here, it may look like an old scrap of cloth, but this could be Sham indicating that the Shadow Mantle looks like a regular article of clothing due to the Shadow Crystals not being visible. What's especially interesting about this Shadow Mantle is that it seems to be the pacifist counterpart to the Twisted Sword. The Twisted Sword is a Sham-related item that utilizes the crystals and is needed in order to kill some unknown opponent, while the Shadow Mantle is also a Sham-related item that utilizes the crystals and is needed in order to survive some unknown opponent. Interestingly, the Shadow Mantle would likely act as an armor item, while the Twisted Sword would act as a weapon. This seems to tie into the fact that when defeating the secret bosses, you'll get a weapon if you defeat them with violence, while you'll get an armor item if you defeat them without violence. As such, it could be that the Twisted Sword and Shadow Mantle are opposites in that regard. Although, there is one more detail that either hurts this analysis or helps it, depending on how you interpret it. Another unused piece of armor in the game files is an item called the Sky Mantle. The Sky Mantle has this description. A cape that shimmers fluorescently, protects against elect and holy attacks. 
We don't know how this item is acquired, but it's possible that the Sky Mantle is a purified version of the Shadow Mantle, and thus the main difference is that the Sky Mantle uses pure crystals instead of shadow crystals. If this is true, then that would imply that pure crystals glow or shimmer in some way. That said, you could argue that the existence of the Sky Mantle is proof that the Shadow Mantle doesn't actually have anything to do with the Shadow Crystals. After all, if it really was tied to the Shadow Crystals, why wouldn't the Sky Mantle be called the Pure Mantle if it's really a purified version of the Shadow Mantle? Even so, while not confirmed, I do actually believe the Shadow and Sky Mantles are tied to the Shadow Crystals, and the main reason for that belief is the choice to use the word fluorescent to describe the Sky Mantle. You see, the definition of fluorescence is the property of absorbing light of short wavelength and emitting light of longer wavelength. That sticks out to me quite a bit, as that is almost exactly how we described the shadow crystals earlier in this video. The shadow crystals also absorb light, hence why they cast a shadow, while also emitting a different kind of light in the form of the visions that you see. That similarity seems a little too on the nose for me to ignore. Admittedly, the use of the word fluorescent may not mean as much as I'm giving it credit for. I know some folks think I read too much into things, but personally, I think this all adds up quite well and shows that there is an above average chance that our analysis of the Shadow Mantle in relation to the Shadow Crystals is well founded. Side note, I really love the visual of a character wielding the twisted sword and the shadow mantle. Just imagine a character wielding a dark, twisted blade while their cloak shimmers with starlight as it billows in the wind. That is a pretty cool aesthetic, I must say. Back on topic. Sadly, like I said, none of this shadow mantle analysis really narrows down the list of our theories, so while we may have shown how interconnected the shadow crystals, pure crystals, shadow mantle, sky mantle, and twisted sword are, we still don't know what or how or why these crystals are the way that they are. In fact, we don't even have an answer to this question from earlier due to the fact that these shadow crystals are more than likely to be tied to Gaster, and Gaster is tied to sci-fi technology, magic, and reality warping. His most iconic creation, the Core, is a piece of super advanced technology that generates magical electricity while also having some sort of reality warping properties, as it was the Core that shattered Gaster across time and space. As such, since Gaster is tied to all three of these concepts, that means the Shadow Crystals could also be tied to all three of these as well. These crystals could actually be some sort of advanced magical technology that warps reality in order to give visions of things in different points in time and space. So, after all this analysis and investigation, was it all for nothing? Are we still completely in the dark? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. I think the analysis we've done today has definitely brought us closer to the truth. Based off our conclusions, it seems likely that these shadow crystals are some sort of tool that allows you to see into different points in time and space, and that the shadow crystals are a broken, impure, or incomplete version of a pure crystal. 
In turn, we've concluded that these crystals can be utilized to grant you a substantial edge in combat, which is why they can be used to create the Shadow Mantle and Twisted Sword, two pieces of equipment that are designed to let you defeat otherwise unbeatable enemies. We also have a better understanding of the exact properties of these shadow crystals, as they are objects that can block light and cast shadows, but also project images, which paints an interesting and particular view of how these objects function. Overall, I'd say we've done a fairly admirable job as a community narrowing down the possibilities using just the facts we currently have available to us. Now, before I move on to the final segment of this video, there is one more piece of information regarding the Shadow Crystals that I have yet to discuss. I didn't bring it up until now because I wasn't sure what it meant or if it was important for our analysis. However, it would be unprofessional if I didn't at least give it my two cents. You see, when you bring Spamton Shadow Crystal to Sham, they say this. Oh, is that so? That salesman had found the crystal in the old machine. I wonder if perhaps long ago that old machine was very important to someone. A certain Lightner, perhaps. Or maybe it's just a hunch. Haha. <laughs> At any rate, it's truly unfortunate a Darkner decided to steal that power. This sequence of dialogue is pretty harmless and doesn't seem all that important to the Shadow Crystals if you assume Sham is talking about the Neo-Robot body and nothing else. If this is just Sham saying that the old machine was powerful because it was important to a Lightner, and this dialogue is just meant to clue us in on the lore of the Neo robot, then this dialogue isn't terribly important for our analysis. However, if you assume that Sham brought all this up because it was relevant to the nature of the Shadow Crystals, then this dialogue could mean something very different. You see, when Sham says it's unfortunate a Darkner decided to steal that power, if Sham is not talking about the Neo robot and is actually talking about the power of the Shadow Crystals, then that could be implying that Shadow Crystals are somehow created by Lightners, and that these crystals manifest near things that Lightners care about. Namely, it could be that the hopes and dreams of Metaton, who likely made the Neo-Robot, manifested into the form of this Shadow Crystal, and that's why the crystal is found in the old machine. That could be an interesting piece of lore regarding the Shadow Crystals, if it's true. However, we don't know if it's true, and when viewed through the lens of Spamton's history as a character, it becomes harder and harder to tell what's true and what's important in this text. You see, in this line, Sham implies that Spamton only discovered this shadow crystal after finding the old machine, which, at first glance, seems to be implying that Spamton only acquired the crystal after we uploaded him into the Neo Robot. However, if you go back to this butler and talk to him after defeating Spamton Neo, he says something interesting. Spamton? This used to be his room. Though it's not like he used it after a while. Eventually, he just spent all his time in the basement praying. When things went downhill, he became obsessed with that artifact. Maybe he thought it would give him another big break. 
This is very interesting because we know this artifact the butler mentioned was almost certainly the Neo robot, but Spamton praying is the most intriguing element. A possibility that occurs to me is that while the butlers may have thought Spampton was praying, he may have actually been staring into the shadow crystal he found in the old machine, hoping to see a vision that would help him. In fact, it may be that the way Gaster helped Spamton become such a big shot was by using the shadow crystals to see visions of the future, and by using those visions, Spamton was able to become a much more successful salesman. But after Gaster cut him off, Spamton had to find his own path to success, and thus spent all his time staring at the shadow crystal, desperately praying for a vision that could help him find his next big break. I'm speculating a little bit here, but the point is, Spamton likely found this shadow crystal before he went insane, and since he spent all his time praying at this old machine, there's a good chance that he went insane as a result of the shadow crystal's visions. The overall point of all of this is that we don't actually know when or how the Shadow Crystal found its way inside of the Neo Robot. Maybe it manifested as a result of Metaton's hopes and dreams, or maybe Gaster hit it there, and the reason he helped Spamton was to lure him into discovering the Shadow Crystal. We just don't know. You can see now why I didn't bring up this dialogue from Shom or this backstory with Spamton during the main analysis, as while it's definitely very interesting, we just don't know at this point in time how exactly this all fits into the greater lore of the Shadow Crystals. But now, it's time. Time for us to step outside the boundaries of facts and objective analysis and into the realm of speculation. It's time for theories that are either mad genius or, as this Redditor puts it, off the rails conspiracy theories. It's time for my theory. You see, while I do agree with several elements of these final three theories, I don't actually believe that any of them are the truth. I think the truth of the Shadow Crystals is one that you could never have guessed at, unless you went down the rabbit hole into the wonderland of speculative theory crafting the way I did. You see, my theory is one that builds on my past theories, and those past theories are already so contentious that it's understandable if you haven't arrived at the same conclusions as me. My Shadow Crystal Theory, my dear viewers, is actually rather simple at first glance. In fact, it's one of the theories I dismissed earlier. My theory is that the Shadow Crystals actually show the past. If you are a new viewer, and this is the first video of mine that you've seen, then you must be very confused. I can hear you saying now, but Jaru, didn't you dismiss the past theory as not making sense because it provides no believable benefit in combat? Doesn't that prove it can't be what the Shadow Crystals are showing? Indeed, dear newcomer, that was a roadblock that the past theory failed to overcome. The crystals showing the past just doesn't make sense if we're dealing with a linear timeline. 
If you've seen my other theories, then you'll likely know exactly what I'm about to say. You see, at the end of my Deltarune magic video, I revealed one of my grander theories. I believe that Deltarune is, in fact, stuck in a Groundhog's Day style time loop, and this time loop has been created by the angel from the prophecy. My theory holds that at the end of the game, the angel will reset this reality and return us right back to the start of chapter one, with all our memories erased. I won't go into full detail on why I believe this is the case, as I cover all that in my other video. But all you need to know from this video is that Deltarune is trapped in an endless cycle where the characters are forced to live out their days only to get sent hurtling back in time with all their memories gone. It's literally what happened to Sans in Undertale. Only this time, in Deltarune, we too are powerless to stop it. We are just one more victim in a world filled with victims. And this horrible reality is the reality that is revealed by the Shadow Crystals. So, let's look at the evidence and see how my time loop theory holds up. Starting with the visions, my theory has all the advantages of the past theory, and thus these visions all make perfect sense. All these things did indeed happen in the past, so the shadow crystals are easily able to show them. But wait, my time loop theory actually improves on the past theory because instead of saying that Spampton and Jevil may have seen something horrible in the crystals, my theory can tell you exactly what it was that they saw. Spampton and Jevil looked into the shadow crystals and saw the horrible reality of the angel's heaven. They saw that their world and their lives were utterly meaningless, as nothing they could do would stop the angel from resetting everything. In other words, Spamton and Jevil saw that their choices don't matter, and that's what drove them to insanity. In fact, I would argue that the Shadow Crystals were integral to causing this shift in personality within Jevil and Spamton. You see, even if these two had an encounter with Gaster, would Gaster's words really be enough to drive them insane? We all agree that this encounter with Gaster is responsible for their madness, but logically, words alone wouldn't be enough. Even if I walked up to you and told you that your choices don't matter and your whole life was a lie, that wouldn't be enough to convince you. You would just assume I'm crazy. As such, why would Jevil and Spampton believe Gaster about the Angel's time loop? Simple. He had evidence in the form of the Shadow Crystals. These crystals allow Jevil and Spampton to see this terrible fate with their own eyes. And as they saw their own past lives and past time loops and saw things that proved the legitimacy of the crystal's visions, they realized that Gaster was telling the truth. This time loop was real, and the Shadow Crystals proved it. 
Jevil took this information and used it as justification to treat the whole world as a game because he now knew that his actions don't have consequences. Meanwhile, Spampton took the news a lot harder. He was traumatized and horrified by this revelation, and thus spent all his time in the basement staring into the Shadow Crystal, desperately searching for a vision that could help him defy this destiny. He needed power. He needed enough power to defeat the Angel. That's why he was obsessed with the Neo-Robot. That's why he wanted Chris's soul. He needed the power of Lightners in order to stand a chance against this fate. That is also why Sham has become nihilistic in their old age. When Jevil mentioned some of the terrible visions he saw, the visions that didn't make sense, but didn't not make sense either, those words stuck in Sham's cotton. Over time, Sham started to believe what Jevil said, and their perspective has grown darker yet darker. That's why Sham says to the heroes that one day soon, they too will realize the futility of their actions, and that fate is not on their side. Furthermore, my time loop theory also completely nullifies the main problem of the past theory, as seeing into previous cycles of this time loop holds a great deal of combat benefit due to the characters being stuck repeating themselves. Even though the crystals are showing the past, Thanks to the time loop, they're also technically showing the future, which means these visions can give you all the benefits of the future theory as well. As such, thanks to effectively being able to see the future through looking at past cycles, my theory also explains why the Shadow Crystals are useful components for creating the Shadow Mantle and the Twisted Sword. A magical cloak that lets you know where your enemy's attack is going to come from would be hugely beneficial, and a magical sword that can look into previous time loops in order to know when and where to deliver a deadly blow is a terrifying weapon. This, of course, brings me to the most interesting detail of this theory. The Weird Route. Using the context of the time loop, we can deduce what the importance of the weird route is and how it ties into the greater narrative of Deltarune. You see, once we complete Deltarune using a completely pacifist playstyle, we will discover that all of our efforts and all of our kindness was not enough to stop the reset from happening. We spared everyone, we made countless friends, we stood together against a dark god, and it wasn't enough. But that won't satisfy you. You, the one watching this video, won't be happy with that ending, that outcome. You will insist on getting your happy ending. As a result, you will resort to the exact same strategy Spampton was using. If making friends and being kind won't let you defeat the angel, then maybe killing enemies and gaining strength might do the trick. 
The purpose of the weird route and the reason you are walking this path is because you will believe that it is necessary to acquire a great deal of strength in order to rival the angel. That's why you need the Shadow Mantle and the Twisted Sword. That's why you need people like Noel to grow stronger and stronger. You need ruthlessness and power in order to defeat the angel. Or so you believe. You see, as much as you would like to think this path is the true way forward, as much as you'd like to think that somewhere, somehow, there's a route that will allow you to defeat the angel and free this world, it's not going to happen. The end point of the Snow Grave route won't be a triumphant victory against a dark god. It will be you slaughtering all of your friends and family only to realize it was all for nothing. You will become so incredibly powerful and then watch as your power is stripped away. This isn't Undertale. In that game, the choice to spare or kill had consequences. It led to different endings. It led to different outcomes. Not in Deltarune. You can be a savior or you can be a genocidal maniac and it won't change a thing. There is no saving this world. There is no happily ever after. But wait, there's more. There's one last mystery that my theory could provide a clear answer to. Specifically, the mystery of Ralsei's knowledge. Ralsei has claimed to have spent all his life living alone in the castle town with nobody else to interact with. So, dear viewers, how could he have learned about the prophecy and the roaring and the Delta Warriors? How could he know more about the nature of Darkners than characters like King and Queen? How could he know the fate of this world and yet not know basic things like how to make friends? The answer is, of course, the Shadow Crystals. Using a Shadow Crystal, Rousset would have seen the Roaring play out time and time again. And through his visions, he would have realized the tragic fate of this world. He realized this terrible destiny, and yet he did not go mad. Why? Because, unlike Jevil and Spampton, Ralsei is a good person. In fact, He's not just good, he is sincerely, honestly, and clearly a fantastic person. He is sweet and kind and generous and respectful and a pacifist. I know it's popular to theorize that Ralsei is secretly evil or secretly going to betray us, but I don't believe that for a second. Which, honestly, might surprise you, given how crazy my theories get sometimes, but I honest to god do not believe Ralsei is anything more than a good, sweet boy trying his hardest to make the best of a bad situation. When Ralsei tells Chris and Susie this prophecy of light and dark, where the forces of good overcome the forces of evil and manage to banish the angel's heaven, I think he's saying this to give Chris and Susie hope. He knows the fate of this world, and hell, he might even believe there's a chance they could break the time loop. But in his heart of hearts, I think he knows this world is doomed, 
and he's just doing his best to keep his friends from giving in to despair. He's trying to be the light in the dark for them. He's trying to prepare them for the horrors ahead. He's trying to make sure that if these are their last days on Earth, that at least they are happy days. He does his best to gently guide them towards the path that he believes will bring them the most happiness, but he doesn't force anything upon them. He knows that Chris and Susie don't have any real choices in this world. So even if he disagrees with their behavior at times, he never forces anything upon them, as he wants them to enjoy their illusion of freedom while it lasts. He may have even used the shadow crystals to help him build their special rooms in his castle, and that's why they suit their individual tastes so perfectly. He probably built these rooms before ever meeting Chris and Susie, and that's why he won't let you enter his castle at the start of Chapter 1. Furthermore, the Shadow Crystals may be how Ralsei knows exactly what Chris's room looks like, as well as all the food items that Susie enjoys. The crystals are also the reason behind Ralsei trying to convince Susie and Chris to not think too hard about the things Spamton said during his boss fight. Ralsei knows what drove Spamton mad, but he doesn't want Chris and Susie to be forced to face that same horror just yet. He also doesn't want them to suffer the way Spamton suffered. It's not because Ralsei is secretly evil or anything like that. He just doesn't want his friends poking their noses into things that will only bring them misery. Ralsei does have some secrets, but these secrets aren't tied to him being evil. They are tied to him being more good than anyone else in this franchise. Ralsei is in my opinion, the most moral and ethical person we've ever met. When faced with the horrors of a world where your choices don't matter, he didn't give in to despair or lose his mind. He held his chin high, looked this fate dead in the eye, and said, so be it. If this is the world he has been born into, then he was going to bring as much happiness and joy into that world as he could in the time that is given to him. And when this story is all over, I suspect he may even make one final promise to his friends. A promise that even when the light runs low and the world is consumed by darkness, he will still be with them in that darkness. But hey, that's just my interpretation. As with all my theories, there is a fair amount of speculation, although it was definitely a lot easier to reach this conclusion than my previous theories. This was basically just an expansion on my theory from the Deltarune Magic video, but with a deeper dive into Spamton, Sham, and the Shadow Crystals. Although, given the retreading of old ground, this might be the first video of mine where the more down-to-earth analysis was more interesting than my own theory. Oh well, gotta mix things up occasionally, I suppose. <laughs> Before I end the video, I should point out two things that I can foresee you guys bringing up. The first thing is that, during my analysis, I refuse to acknowledge the possibility that the Shadow Crystals operate differently in the Light World than they do in the Dark World, despite that being an idea many people have suggested. 
For example, some have theorized that the crystals show the truth while you're in the dark world, but show lies while you're in the light world, or some other mixture of the theories that we discussed. The reason I didn't acknowledge that possibility is because I'm a big proponent of Occam's razor when it comes to theory crafting, and while it's possible that the basic function of the crystals changes between worlds, that would add an extra layer of complexity to this mystery, which would make any theories reliant on the crystals changing their function less likely to be true. It's not impossible, mind you. Maybe the crystals show the truth in the dark world and the past in the light world, or some other combo. But generally speaking, the simpler the explanation, the more likely it is to be true. So I avoided that line of logic. Plus, there isn't much consistency with regards to what objects get changed in the Dark World and what objects stay the same. Noelle's watch is the same in both worlds, but not Chris's pencils, for example. Even the objects that do change don't always change a great deal. Like, Chris's pencils becoming swords isn't really all that complex of a change. They're just becoming larger, fancier versions of what they already were. So it's quite possible that the crystals are not changed or aren't changed significantly either. Plus, I'm inclined to think the crystals in particular don't actually change at all between worlds. In both worlds, you see Chris refer to them as pieces of glass. They don't seem to grow or shrink when switching worlds, and they always allow you to see visions, which seems to imply that they're already supernatural in nature, and thus the dark world doesn't do much to change them. Aside from a few supernatural entities like ghosts and fire elementals, the shadow crystals are the only instance of supernatural forces appearing in the light world, so I reckon they're probably an exception to the rules that govern the magic and reality warping powers in this setting. The second thing I wanted to address is that I decided not to bring up one particular fact regarding the Shadow Crystals. Specifically, so long as you defeat Jevil on any save file, his Shadow Crystal will appear by this cliff. Shom outright seems aware of the fact that this world exists in some sort of time loop scenario, and that's why they believe you should be able to find Jevil's stuff nearby so long as you defeated him in any previous playthrough. This entire interaction seems like extremely good evidence in favor of my time loop theory, but the issue is that it's hard to tell what part of this is canon and what part of this is just game mechanics. The Shadow Crystals in particular have been tinkered with a lot during the various patches to the game, so it's possible that this interaction with Shom is not meant to be canon and is just meant to be a gameplay fix designed to smooth out the awkwardness of Deltarune releasing one chapter at a time. If you count this interaction as canon, then it's pretty strong evidence in favor of the Shadow Crystals having some sort of time-related powers. Maybe Jevil saw that you defeated him in a previous cycle and decided to give you his stuff anyway because he knew you'd earned it, or something along those lines. It's not super important for contributing to my theory, or any of the theories, really, so you can consider this canon or non-canon as you please. Either way is fine, but I thought I should explain why I didn't give this particular evidence much attention. And with that, I think I've just about wrapped up everything I have to say about the Shadow Crystals. 
this was definitely a much more manageable project than my night video. <laughs> if my math is correct, I think this video should end up being just under two hours long. Although, don't quote me on that. Uh, regardless, it should be at least an hour and a half, so I hope this scratches your itch for long-form Deltarune content for this month. <laughs> I'm not sure what my next video will be at this point. I may scrounge together a new theory, or I may upload a full playthrough of Deltarune Chapter 1 where I go through the game and point out all the tiny little details and how they might fit into my theories and the greater lore of this game. Actually, I would love to hear your feedback on that. Let me know in the comments below if you prefer to see another theory video, or if you'd prefer to see a full lore slash theory crafting playthrough of Deltarune Chapter 1. And of course, if a Chapter 1 playthrough did well, I'd be more than happy to do a Chapter 2 playthrough as well. So yeah, definitely let me know what you guys think. And if you're still fiending for Deltarune content, I recommend checking out Andrew Cunningham's video on Deltarune's narrator. It's a hilarious video with top-tier editing that definitely deserves more support. So head over there, give it a look, it's a really good time. And with that, I think I'll go ahead and sign off for today. Like if you enjoyed the video, comment if you've got something to say, subscribe if you want to see more, and as always, have a fantastic day.